Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Mac Pritchard, publisher of Max List, and I'm joined here in the Max List studio by my colleague, Ben Forstag, managing director of Max List. I appreciate everyone tuning in for this webinar. Uh, today, we're talking about common job search mistakes. And I've made all of these mistakes myself. And we'll also share with you ideas or strategies for uh, avoiding these mistakes and and specific tips about how to get the jobs. Let's uh, pause for a moment. Uh, uh, we'll go straight into the agenda in a moment, but let's wait just a few more minutes, a minute or two, while others join us. How many people do you see uh, tuning in right now, Ben? Well, we have 90 people in the room right now, uh, more showing up as I speak, and several folks are saying hello. Let's see if I can scroll through some of these names. Mike Adams, Sandra, Sandra Seidel, Leah McKenzie, Tom, Jessica, Will, Maureen, Kim, Sean, Kathleen, Paul, Don, Richard. Lots of people are saying hi. Okay, good. And I also want to thank everybody for sharing your questions. We were so impressed by the number of questions we received. Uh, more than 300, Ben tells me. Yeah, about 350. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so today we will do our best to... We, we did take some time to sort through the questions and pick out representative questions in different areas. But we also, in the second half of the webinar, will be with you for an hour. I want to hear from you all who are in the room. And uh, so please have your questions ready, and we'll spend about 30 minutes responding to them by now. Mac, if we could just wait one second here. Let me sure. play with the sound, because some folks are saying they're having a hard time hearing us. OK. Is this better, everyone? Can you hear us now? If you could just write in the chat box whether you can hear us loud and clear. We appreciate that feedback because we want this to be a great experience for you. And Mac, they're saying you're still a little bit quiet, so okay. let's get you a little closer to that microphone. All right. We'll do Make that. friends with the microphone. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ben. I'm hoping that the, that's better. OK. Folks are saying much better. OK, great. Well, it's about a uh, Three or four minutes after two, I think we'll get started. Does that sound right to you, Ben? Yep. OK. Well, thank you all for joining us. Again, our theme today is uh, uh, common job search mistakes. We're going to talk about four of them. Let's dive into the agenda. Uh, in addition to the job searching mistakes, I want to share with you my own story. As I mentioned, for people who might have joined us uh, a moment or two ago, I've made all of these job search mistakes. And in spite of that, I've, I've learned how to avoid, not only how to avoid them, but uh, in my own career and in our work at MaxList, how to uh, use strategies to find and uh, get great hidden jobs. And we're going to share some of our best uh, uh, hidden job hacks with you today. And we also want to uh, allow plenty of time for your questions. So let's get started. If you aren't familiar with MaxList, we're based in Portland, Oregon. We're an online community for people looking for rewarding creative work. And our services include a, a job board uh, for positions mostly in the Pacific Northwest. But we serve a national, even a global audience through our podcast, which we publish every Wednesday, Find Your Dream Job, as well as two books, uh, including a new one this year, Land Your Dream Job Anywhere, our blog, and our newsletters. Um, again, and we focus on the nuts and bolts of job hunting and career management in our educational materials. And uh, we also uh, help employers through our job board find talented, creative people who are looking for work with purpose. So let's jump into the job search mistakes. Uh, and again, we'll talk about the solutions and, and strategies to avoid these mistakes and things you should do differently. But the first ser job search mistake I hear a lot, um, Ben and I and, and the MaxList team, because we talk to a lot of job seekers, uh, we've run across this uh, a lot, it's I'm keeping all my options open. Uh, and I hear this when I ask people what they're looking for uh, and how their search is going. And I appreciate the sentiment behind this. Uh, I think when we're looking for work, uh, we, we want to be open to all possibilities. But here's the problem. Uh, when we don't narrow our focus and have specific job goals, 
makes it really hard for people to help us. Because if you think about it for a moment, if you, instead of saying I'm keeping all my options open, say instead I'm looking for a position as a, a teacher at a, at a community college, or I want to work in a development position for a mid-sized nonprofit uh, in this metro area. Or maybe you say, I, I'm interested in uh, providing legal services to, um, uh, to corporations uh, in this state. The more specific you are uh, about your goal, the, the, again, the easier it is for people to say yes to you. And they will think of opportunities or contacts or organizations or things you might do uh, when you are specific about what you want to say or what you want to do rather. Now I, I know many people say, well, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know exactly what I want to do. That's why I'm keeping my options open. Push back on that and challenge you to come up with a short list of two or three goals you want to explore. And I, I find in conversations, with people when I do that one-on-one, -on -one, everybody is carrying around in their head uh, two, three, four goals that, that interest them, uh, different possibilities. And when you say those out loud uh, and you start using other methods like informational interviews or networking, the strategies that can help you uncover hidden jobs as you pursue those, uh, those areas of interest, those three or four goals, you'll find where your energy lies. And uh, you'll also see doors start to open for you. And you'll begin to, not, uh, through conversations and, and meetings with others, uncover hidden jobs in the areas that do interest you. So uh, as much as possible, don't keep your options open. Look for uh, specific opportunities. Here's a, a, another common job search mistake. It's applying early, often, and everywhere. And again, I, I've been unemployed twice in my career. I happen to be in my late 50s, so I have a long place. And I can remember the first time I was out of work, I would get up every day, look at, and this was way back in the 80s, look at the newspaper, and I would find the, the 5, 10, or 12 jobs that seemed relevant. Uh, I didn't have clear goals then. And I would fire off resumes. Today, of course, we use job boards, and we do all this online. but uh, if you apply everywhere, you're probably not going to go uh, anywhere fast because you're, you, again, you need to have focus, you need to have goals, and you need to be strategic about how you spend your time and your energy. Your time is your most valuable resource, and you've got to invest it strategically in pursuit of goals that are going to help you get the job you want. So. Uh, we're going to talk later in this presentation about the hidden job market and how it works and how most jobs are filled by word of mouth. Uh, and that is something you want to take into consideration when you think about how you spend your time. But don't spend your days, 100% uh, of your time, applying for jobs everywhere. Here's a, another common mistake, and it's related to number two. Um, people spend all day long looking at job boards. Again, we'll talk about the hidden job market in a moment, but here's the headline. Most jobs never make it to job boards. And so uh, you, need to, uh, you need to spend your time. Yes, look at job boards. I, we happen to run one at, at MaxList. We're very proud of the service we offer and the value our employers get from it. But employers and, and job board operators like us recognize that Again, most jobs are filled by word of mouth through networking and personal relationships. And again, if you're spending 100% of your time on job boards, you're likely missing out on uh, the jobs that uh, might interest, interest you the most. Mistake number four, waiting to be picked. Uh, so many job seekers I see, and again, I've, I've done this myself in my own career, they wait for a position to be posted. Uh, and the, uh, most job seekers I know, for example, they, they tell me they want to work at a particular company or organization, and, and they wait for that company or organization to post a position. You don't need to wait to, uh, to find opportunities in those organizations or companies. 
there are ways that you can get inside those um, those places and learn about jobs uh, before they're posted, or uh, many of them may never be posted. And we're going to talk again about that in a moment. So before we talk about the hidden job market, I want to share with you my own story. I, I've been uh, blessed to have a very uh, very good career. Uh, I've been a speechwriter to a governor of Oregon. I've worked uh, in uh, communications for a mayoral candidate. I've worked uh, as a spokesman for public agencies and nonprofits, and I currently run my own public relations company. And uh, but I wasn't, and I could tell you a story that about all the success I've enjoyed. But there's another story too, and. Uh, that's me in the photo. I'm standing next to, um, it's the 1980s, as you might uh, figure out from the haircut and the skinny tie. I'm standing next to the president of El Salvador. And when I got out of college in 1980, there were three things I wanted to do. I wanted to do writing, electoral politics, and human rights advocacy. And I had the opportunity to do that, uh, to work in the human rights field uh, right after college. Um, I went to work for a human rights organization in D.C. We worked with uh, international and national media. I was in the early 20s. I was pitching the New York Times. That job led to another one that was never advertised in Boston, where we took members of Congress on fact-finding trips to Central America. And uh, we met with heads of state, uh, U.S. ambassadors, um, human rights leaders. And that's how this particular photo came to be. Here's the point of the story, not to tell you what a grand guy I was or how much success I was enjoying. I thought jobs were easy to get, and I found that that wasn't the case, that most jobs uh, uh, aren't, are, again, filled by word of mouth. And so I quit this job in uh, after five years because the program went into a different direction, and I thought getting that, that third job uh, would be easy, and it wasn't. Um, let me tell you about my first job search. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I thought the next job would come easy, and it didn't. And there were two problems I, I was wrestling with. One was I wasn't clear about what I wanted to do next. I was in my mid-20s living in Boston. And most of the jobs in international relations were in New York and, and Washington, D.C. And I didn't want to move. So. Um, Every week, I would send out resume after resume, and, and I, was, I would get interviews, but I never got an offer, and I think it was because uh, the people interviewing me were very, could tell I was unclear about my goals. So uh, I struggled with this for about eight months. I was out of work, and my unemployment ran out, and I wasn't quite sure what to do next. My wife, uh, at the time, my wife worked at a local university with a uh, and there was someone in the career services office there who agreed to meet with me, who took me through a process of goal setting and taught me the basics of networking. And I got clear about my goals, and I decided what I wanted to do was work, take my media relations skills, and uh, uh, find a job in government or politics in Boston, Massachusetts, where I'd been living for five years. So I started a series of conversations with people who were expert in that field, and Within about six weeks, I had a job offer. I became the first public information officer for the Boston's Big Dig. And people who uh, can remember back to the 1980s and 90s might recall it was the largest public works project in the United States at the time, and it certainly is one of the top two or three in history. It was a great job. Uh, it was never advertised. I got it through word of mouth, and I didn't have close political connections or didn't really know the people who hired me all that well. They were, uh, I met them through uh, informational interviewing and networking techniques we're going to talk about in a moment. But here's the point I want to make. Um, uh, I've used those same methods uh, to find other great jobs, uh, to work in the governor's office out here in Oregon, uh, to work at City Hall here in Portland, jobs that were never posted, never advertised, that were rewarding, uh, satisfying, and uh, and uh, you can use those same techniques as well. So the best jobs I've found are what's called the hidden job market. And uh, there are estimates out there. No one is quite certain uh, what the exact number is. But as many as 60, up to 80% of all jobs are never posted. 
they're filled by word of mouth. And there's no conspiracy here. What's happening is it's human nature. People hire people they know or are recommended to them by people they trust. And so our challenge when we're looking for work and we want, uh, and once we begin avoiding those common job search mistakes and we want to find and get these hidden jobs is we need to learn how the hidden job market works and put ourselves in positions so that people think of us when they're filling a position through word of mouth. Um, think uh, again about those numbers. If uh, we happen to be in Oregon, I know people are calling in from around the United States, and uh, but our you know a typical job niche job board like ours might have four or five hundred listings a month. Now in this state, um, according to the state employment department, there are about up to 80,000 uh, online listings in a typical month. And we're a mid-sized state. We rank about 25th or 26th in population. If 60 up to 80% of all jobs are posted, that means hundreds of thousands of jobs are out there being filled through personal networks. And our, you know, your, the, the obvious question is, is your dream job one of them? I, I bring up those numbers because uh, I also want to challenge you to think about how you use your time. Uh, again, many of the job seekers that Ben and I and the rest of the team meet, they're spending uh, 70, 80, 90 percent of their time responding to job work postings or, or publicly advertised positions. Uh, but if, and, and they're not doing a lot of networking, so if up to 80 percent of all jobs are filled by word of mouth, are you spending 100 percent of your time on job boards? And if you are, need to think about uh, uh, changing that strategy because you're missing out on some great jobs. So let's talk about um, word of mouth. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us have gotten a letter like this. I got this email about a year ago and it was from a friend who was retiring at a state agency here in Oregon and he was looking for suggestions about possible candidates. Um, I think everybody who's been in the workplace for a while, a few years, uh, gets these notes occasionally. And uh, but how can you? But there are ways uh, and things, steps you can take, and or ways you can get more of these notes and get in front of high, uh, people who are filling jobs through word of mouth. So let's talk about those. Let, uh, there are three ways really to hack that hidden job market. Uh, the first is informational interviewing. The second is networking at events. And the third is through volunteering and internships. Today, I, our time is limited, so I want to talk about um, informational interviewing. But if you visit our blog and our, our books, and we have some free on, online courses as well, there is lots and lots of information about how you can uh, do all three of these things. So uh, informational interview, uh, often People approach this by asking someone, can we have a coffee? Or can I, I pick your brain? And uh, But an informational interview is a business meeting. And it has an agenda. And it has a structure. Uh, you can have a, uh, a structured conversation with someone, an informational interview that lasts 20 or 30 minutes at most. And it allows you to do three things, really. The first is to introduce yourself and, and share your goals. And you can do that in a few minutes. Um, the second is it helps you broaden your professional network because it's an opportunity to ask someone for questions, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, suggestions about other people you can reach out to. And you can also, uh, the third thing you can do in an informational interview is explore opportunities in um, your field of interest. And uh, you can uncover hidden jobs by asking questions like, who might be growing? Who's getting uh, new investors? Who might have uh, received a grant? Um, what what programs do you see in uh, in our field uh, uh, matched my goals that might be adding staff? Uh, who are the leaders uh, in this world that I should be reaching out to, or the professional groups I should get involved in? And as you ask these focused questions, you'll start you'll uh, identify the the organizations that are growing. Uh, the managers and leaders who are respected and are doing interesting things, and, and most importantly, the places that will be adding positions or where there might be vacancies, 
again, most of which will probably never be advertised. So I, I know people, uh, uh, when I, I encourage them to do informational interviews, they say, gosh, any of them, uh, I'm not sure who to contact, or I don't have a network, or um, every, and, and here's the deal, everybody has a network. And you don't have to have 5,000 contacts in your LinkedIn profile to be an effective uh, uh, networker or to do informational interviews well. Less is more. And what you want to focus on are the people who know you well. Uh, you can start with current and past coworkers. Um, don't forget your alumni networks at your colleges. You don't have to have gone to a, a fancy Ivy League school to have a great uh, network in, in, your, uh, in your college. And never neglect family, friends, and neighbors. You never know, uh, as you tell people about your goals and your interests and the places you want to work, the kinds of jobs you want to do, who might know of someone uh, uh, or have an action to a hiring manager or employer that you want to get in front of. So a successful informational interview, often people say, gosh, um, I, 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 I had an appointment with Mary. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it went very well. I didn't get a job. You never want to ask for a job in an informational review. Instead, success has really um, three outcomes in, in a meeting like this. The first is the host knows who you are, what you've done, and, and what you want to do. They have a clear idea of that. And, they, and the value of that is when they hear of opportunities or they're asked recommendations, they'll know your story. and uh, what your interests are and what your accomplishments are. And there, you can do that in three to five minutes. You can tell your story and, and tell people what you've accomplished and what you're looking for. Uh, a good, again, a second thing that happens in a successful informational interview is you have a sense of where the opportunities are in your field, in, in your area of interest, what companies or nonprofits might be growing or hiring, uh, who's getting new resources, who's going in a new direction that might need uh, someone with your skills and experience. And the way you find that out is you construct questions that draw people out exactly about that, uh, about those topics. And you should walk into a meeting with three to five focused questions that address either your interests or perhaps your objections you think people might have for you as a candidate. And the final thing uh, that you get from a good uh, informational interview is at the end of the conversation, you ask for recommendations about two or three other people you might re reach out to. People who take these meetings expect you to do this, and they are not surprised. And I, if you ask, you will almost always get some names. So I want to pause here and uh, listen and hear from you all. Uh, we do have a list of questions that we received by email. But we want to turn to the chat box as well. So Ben, let me turn it back to you, because I know you've been carefully monitoring the screen. Uh, what do we hear from people in our audience? So our first question is from Sandra. And Sandra, I don't want to mispronunciate, mispronunciate your name here. Uh, so I'm going to not say your last name. But Sandra asks, what about remote jobs? Where is it uh, where the jobs are not local, so there's no networking possibility? Well, I th that's a great question, Sandra. I think your challenge when looking for remote work is to identify the hiring manager. And uh, she or he may, well, once you know who that person is, you can reach out to them by email and uh, schedule a conversation by Skype or by telephone, uh, depending on their location. But I, if the work is done remotely, it's, it's no different than a bricks and mortar company. There's a the company has an organizational structure. There are hiring managers, there are needs, and every employer hires to solve problems. So the more you know about that organization's problems, who the hiring managers are that are charged with solving them, and uh, the more successful you'll be as a candidate. So you've got to do some detective work here. And uh, in the case of a remote work, it may be done virtually but the principles are the same. We have a question from Allison who asks, what's the best way to identify who the hiring manager is? Sometimes it's very difficult to tell who is actually doing the hiring. That's a great question too. 
I, I think it begins, Allison, by uh, looking at the company and seeing if you can identify if, uh, uh, contacts that you can reach out in, to inside that organization. So there are a couple of ways you might do that. One is uh, LinkedIn is a, a great roadmap to the inside of any organization. And if you've uh, filled a, if your LinkedIn profile is up to date and you've connected with previous and past coworkers and perhaps uh, students that you, fellow students you went to college with, you have a, a, a robust network that will, if you don't, doesn't give you first degree connections inside a company, uh, will certainly, uh, there's, the odds are good, there will be second or three, third degree connections. And then your challenge is to get those uh, introductions to the second and third degree connections to who can get you who will agree to, to chat with you by phone or in person about um, opportunities inside the organization, what its culture is, and who the decisions make, decision makers are. I, in addition to LinkedIn, I'm a big fan of using college alumni networks. And you don't have to have gone to an Ivy League school to have a powerful alumni network. Um, you know, there, a, a college or university that has and graduating students, even just for a few years, but going back decades, will have many accomplished, uh, successful people in its network. And uh, my experience, both personally and working with job seekers, is that alums love to hear from other alums and are happy to sit down and have these kinds of conversations, these informational interviews. So if you can identify people in your college alumni network who work inside a company or organization, that's a way to get in the door. We're going to go to one of the questions uh, that was sent when people registered for the course. And this is one that we've seen pop up already in the chat here. It's about ageism. So this question comes from this question comes from Wanda, who says, I am 55 plus and have lots of experience, energy and things to offer, but I'm finding it difficult to find jobs. And once I do, I get turned down. How do I sell myself in this stage of my, my life? I have no plans or desire to retire anytime soon. It's a great question. And I and I, I'm 58, so I identify with this, uh, and I, we hear this a lot from MaxList readers and people who come to our events. Um, it is, of course, illegal uh, to discriminate against people because of their age in, the, in hiring, but research shows it's a fact of life and it happens. So how do we overcome that? Um, probably filing a lawsuit is not going to get you anywhere. Uh, again, I'm not, um, it's, it's a serious problem. So I, I find that the people who have the most success uh, uh, overcoming the ageism barrier are the ones who develop the personal and professional relationships with people inside the organization. Uh, and they, they do that again by maintaining those networks throughout their career or doing the kinds of informational interviews we talked about earlier. The personal, you're, you're always going to have more success if there's some tie or connection between you and the hiring manager or people inside the organization. It just gives you a huge advantage. If you see a job you want and you don't know anyone uh, and you apply and you get an interview, well, how do you overcome that barrier then? I think there, I think preparation for the interview is, is crucial. Uh, you want to demonstrate in your the questions you ask and in the way you respond to questions that uh, you want to address unspoken concerns people might have about people in our age group, that we're, we're not learners, that we're, uh, uh, that we are going to be slow to move. I, I'm not endorsing any of these ideas, but you can pull out examples from your, uh, from your career and your approach to work to address those upfront even and those unspoken uh, assumptions. Great. Our next question comes from Mandy who asks, should you apply for a job that is, quote, below you and not what you want in hopes that they will see your potential for a hidden job? It's, this is a good question, too, Mandy. I, and I find that often people want to get inside an organization or an employer, and they'll take an entry-level or mid-level position that maybe they're, uh, that would have been more appropriate five or ten years before in order to get their foot in the door. And I, I actually, I think this is a good strategy, but you have to be clear that uh, you're going to do the job that you're hired for 
and you've got to do that job really well. And once an employer has an experience with you for 6, 12, 18 months in one position, as other opportunities open up, uh, they'll think about you uh, if you do a great job in the position you've taken. I've actually had this followed strategy myself. Uh, when I work, went to work for the governor of Oregon, I took a 10-week assignment, uh, and it was a lateral move. And then I was offered another position. It was actually a, a step down, but it was for nine months I took that. I, but I ended up doing a whole series of positions uh, that led to me being the governor's speechwriter, and I was there for um, more than three years. Uh, but it was because the jobs I took, even if they were junior for someone with my experience, I did with a lot of gusto, and I over-delivered. And so when more appropriate positions opened up, and again, they were never advertised, I was a great candidate and uh, actually the only candidate. So if you can get your foot in the door and show people what you can do and, and you can afford to uh, make, you know, uh, I, I took a pay cut twice uh, and my, my, uh, my wife, bless her, put up with it. Uh, but it was an investment that led to uh, more opportunities and more senior positions and we were able to do that. So let me ask you a follow-up question on that one, Mac. This comes from Jacqueline in Newburgh. She says, what if you are told that you are overqualified for a position and asked why you're applying for it? Uh, this comes up a lot. And uh, if it is a position that you want uh, and it, uh, if there's a reason why perhaps uh, you want less stress, uh, you've made a geographic move, whatever the explanation is for, that, uh, for your interest in that position, lead with it, put it out front, and tell people why right up front. Uh, and, uh, and if you're straightforward about it and you address concerns that, oh, uh, that may go unspoken, you're going to have much more success in the interview process and much, you're much more likely to, to get an offer. Uh, the people I see who apply for positions that uh, require a lot less experience than they have. There's usually a good reason for it. Uh, they, they want to say a part-time position because of uh, family reasons, or they want to move into a new field, and this is their way of breaking in. Uh, whatever that story or explanation is, uh, tell, people, tell the employer up front, particularly in the cover letter if that's your first contact uh, in the application process. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit. I've got a question about networking. This one comes from Lauren in Pittsburgh. She says, I've exhausted most of my professional and personal networks, and I'm having to just apply online. How should I be following up with these online applications? So I think this is a multi-part question here. Uh, it's Well, two thoughts occur to me. One, if you haven't done so, it's it's very appropriate to go back to people in your network if you're in your sixth or, or even uh, ninth or twelfth month of search and let them know how you're doing and it's uh, common for people to to do that uh, again I think the longest I've been out of work was almost a year and I did stay in touch with people in my network uh, I would check in with them every couple of months there was a core group of, of people former employers and colleagues and it, it, it was a good way of getting new leads and getting new perspectives. I would say if you're applying to people uh, for jobs uh, and you don't have immediate contacts in in the organization, think about, again, how you can get those contacts. I find that most people uh, have an interest in working in a company or an organization. There's usually a dream list of five to ten employers locally. And people will tell me that, and they're often uh, – waiting for something to be posted on that employer's website. And I would say this goes back to uh, one of the four mistakes we, we talked about. Uh, don't wait to be picked. If you know you want to work inside an organization, think about how you can network your way into that company. And if you see a, something on a, a job board or the employer's website, you know, jump on it, apply, but also think about as you pursue that formal job application process, if 
there are people in your network who can introduce you to others inside that employer. And it could be as uh, uh, just a simple conversation. You say you've applied for a position, you want to learn more about the, the culture, uh, what it's like to work there, uh, what, what values matter most to the company. And when you have conversations like that, it gets back to HR, it gets back to the hiring managers and in a very positive way. Um, example, I, I worked in state government in Oregon. I was on the executive team of the Oregon Employment Department. I was the communications director. And there was a, a fellow who applied to be the chief information officer of the agency. And we employed about 2,300 people around the state. And he sent in a, an application. Uh, but he also went to one of the local employment department offices, or he called um, and uh, asked for an appointment with, with the office manager. He said, I've applied for a, the, the chief technology officer's job. And would you have 20 minutes just to talk about the work you do here and what your IT needs are and what are some of the challenges you see coming up? It was a brief, friendly conversation. Uh, the fellow got some insights into the IT needs of this local office. And of course, the branch manager immediately called the executive director and told her about this because he was impressed and she was impressed. And uh, it's not the reason this fellow got the job, but he got his name in circulation. People were talking about him. He paid a lot of careful attention to his resume. He had an impressive background, but it also reflected well on him that he just didn't limit himself to the formal application process. He did some homework. He looked for ways to understand the needs of the, of the employer, uh, and he uh, got insights that were very valuable to him during the interview process. The next question comes from Stephen Gilpin. He says, hi, Mac and Ben. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, and looking to relocate to Portland for a new job once my current job ends March 31st. What would your point-counterpoint be to, quote, virtually networking via the web to find a job before moving versus moving first and networking in person? Well, I think anybody, whether you're moving to Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine, or just across the state, Anybody needs to answer the question, do you need to have a job in place first, or are you, are you willing to come without a job and, and do a search on the ground? And there's no right answer here, uh, Stephen, or everybody else who's listening. It really depends on your personal risk for food tolerance and, and your sense of adventure. And uh, anybody who's thinking about moving across the country clearly has a sense of adventure. So I would encourage you to anybody to get clear about that first, and then... Uh, I, I see people who uh, come to Portland or do searches from here in other cities have a lot of success by uh, uh, setting up phone calls, Skype calls, and uh, doing a lot of the informational interview, interviewing and networking virtually. Uh, that was certainly my experience when I came here back in the summer of 91. I had grown up in the Midwest. And I, I lived in New England for nine years in Boston, and I was in graduate school, and I had this idea that I wanted to live in Portland, Oregon, but I, the big problem was this. I'd never actually been west of Denver, uh, but I'd fallen in love with the idea of living in the Pacific Northwest. So I started in January of uh, my last year of graduate school uh, with a couple of names of people who had worked in Oregon, I, and this was pre-internet, so I had a lot of phone calls, and um, I set up a job hunting trip during spring break in March, came out, did um, several dozen informational interviews in person, went back to school in Boston, and that led was, uh, that March trip led to a ser more phone calls, uh, more informational interviews by phone, but it also led to a return trip in June uh, with uh, where I was actually interviewing for jobs that again, had never been advertised, uh, and I got an offer by the end of the month. So it took me about seven months to do it, and I, I did it both ways. I, I made two short trips, and I did it virtually through phone and old-fashioned U.S. mail. Uh, but I've also seen people move here, or I've seen colleagues and friends move to other cities and be on the ground and uh, just do a lot of job hunting intensively for a few months before they get an offer. Sometimes when people make that move without a job, they take a temporary position to pay their bills and 
Uh, it could be a part-time job too that allows them to do intensive job hunting. There's no uh, right or wrong strategy here. It really depends on personal preferences, uh, but I think that the, it's, it's key that you have a clear goal or short list of goals you want to explore uh, and that you don't limit yourself to looking at publicly posted positions, that you get out either in person or by phone and have those informational interviews and, and connect with people. The next question comes from Mika Barrett, who asks, what is the best way to explain a career change in your resume or cover letter? I think that uh, if you've made, you've switched from one field to another, uh, just be clear about the reasons for the change. And, uh, and Ben, does she give details about the career change? Did she take time out for uh, to raise family or did she make switch fields or? No, she's saying she's just looking for a new role, um, not changing employers, but just the, the kind of work she's doing. Well, I, I'm guessing that she's got a set of skills that are, everybody's skills are transferable to a new industry or, or, or field, uh, and, or you need to learn new, new skills, and one way to do that is to return to graduate school. But if you want to change uh, careers, then your challenge is to, to show prospective employers that how your skills are transferable to uh, their organization, their company. And uh, one of the best ways to do that, and this is standard advice for resume writing, but it's also great for career changers too, is be clear about what you've accomplished and the results that you've produced. And, and also when you're making a career change, have a, a, a a clear explanation of why you want to do this and point not only to your accomplishments but previous experiences that shows relevant transferable experience that's going to be beneficial to the employer. We had a series of questions all about qualifications and skills and I'm going to kind of group all of these together into Seth's question. I'm sorry, Mindy's question. Mindy's from Brooklyn, New York and she asks, do you still apply if you're not sure if you have all the necessary skills? It's a great question. Uh, most employers will tell you when they uh, are being candid that they don't expect to get 100% of everything listed in the, in the job posting. If they can get 60 to 70%, they'll be happy because they're looking, uh, they, they expect that nobody's going to have everything. So in addition to say 60 to 70% of the qualifications, they also look for people who have demonstrated that they can learn and master new skills. And if you've got a resume or a cover letter or an application packet that documents that, that's going to uh, be persuasive to a uh, hiring manager reviewing your resume. Um, yeah. I thought we might just take a quick detour here and talk about some of the common frustrations that job seekers have. And I know you can't see the chat that's going on right now, Mac, but there's quite a vibrant uh, discussion about some of the, uh, the frustrations. So let's just uh, kind of hit some of these common ones here. Uh, this one comes from Jerry in Lake Oswego. Again. She says, uh, why waste everyone's time by posting job listings that don't state the salary? Boy, this is a great one. Uh, and this comes up a lot. I, I was recently on just a digression on a webinar for job board operators. They did a survey, Jerry. And they, uh, they found that they asked job applicants what, was, what, are, what were the factors that were to make them more likely to apply for a job. And 70% of respondents, Jerry, said that if a salary was listed, um, they, would, they were much more likely to apply. Uh, we're frustrated that employers don't do this. We operate a job board. Uh, we think that uh, uh, it, it may, when salaries are listed, it, 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 you get better applicant pool because you're clear about what you're buying uh, or what you're rather prepared to invest in someone. And uh, when you talk to employers about it, uh, they, the, the, what we hear back from those who don't list salaries is that they're, uh, uh, they, they just want to see what the, the market uh, might be possible. They're, they're, they're sort of testing the market. I, I think it's not a good use of their time in the long run because if you there's plenty of research 
through sites like uh, Glassdoor that will give you good salary information in different fields and industry. So I share your frustration. Okay, here's another frustration. Uh, this one comes from Narendar in Portland who asks, why do companies advertise jobs and then hire internally? Some, sometimes uh, you see this in government, there's a requirement that positions be uh, post publicly, but the uh, internal candidates are given a preference, and that's frustrating. Uh, I don't think it's a good use of the employer's time if only internal candidates are going to be uh, considered for a position. In the private sector, I think uh, it's it happens because uh, employers want to, again, test the market. Uh, I think that internal candidates have an advantage because they're a known quantity. Uh, you probably can't trump one, five, ten years of service inside an organization, but again, if you can build a connection or even a relationship with someone inside a company uh, while you're not an internal candidate, you'll have an advantage over someone who's applying through uh, a, a job board. One of our listeners just uh, stated another kind of frustration here, one I've never actually heard of. Uh, this one comes from Andrea, or Andrea, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, who says, at a state employment workshop, I was told it is not common for a candidate to inquire about the hiring timeline. Is that true? Well, I, I can't comment on the particular conversation or the advice you got there, but I will say that in our work and, and when we work with other career coaches, um, it's very common for people I, I, for uh, people to be coached to ask that question, and employers expect it. Uh, you know, we uh, I I we, we talk to a lot of employers, and in the high, in the interview process, that's a that's a very common question. Um, in fact, I I would encourage you in the interview if you're not already doing this before you get up and uh, leave the room it's always appropriate to ask about next steps in the hiring process and if there's a specific timetable. And, uh, and the advantage of doing that is it allows you, it helps you manage your expectations, but it helps um, prepare the interview committee or the hiring manager to hear back from you about uh, if, if they've said, well, we hope to make a decision by this date, uh, then you can say, would it be okay if I don't hear back from you by the 15th just to follow up a week or two later? And I, uh, as a candidate and in working with job seekers, I've never had a hiring manager say no. You, they may say, well, yes, why don't you check this date or email me or uh, give me a quick call. But uh, that's, that's powerful stuff to have before you leave the room because if you're interested in the position and you want to follow up, knowing what the timetable is and asking the hiring manager, if you can, if appropriate, follow up by a certain date, uh, give puts you in the driver's seat and helps you manage your own expectations. We have a question here from Helen in Graham, North Carolina. She asks or says, I've been out of work since May 2016. How should I talk about what I've been doing if asked? Saying that I've been job hunting only seems to point out that I failed to land a job. You know, there are a couple approaches you can follow, Helen, and uh, hang in there. I know it's tough. I, again, I personally have been through two long uh, job searches, uh, one almost a year and another eight months, and it, it can be frustrating. What I see people do is uh, they will uh, talk about being in transition, uh, or uh, there are a couple, actually three things. One is you talk about being in transition. Second. Sometimes, depending on their profession or their background, they may set up a, a consulting practice or take a part-time job, and they will say, you know, I'm working as a part-time uh, writer, or I'm a contractor now, uh, doing design work for this company, but I'm looking for a full-time position uh, in, to do this and that. that. And, and so it, uh, the third thing I see people do is they volunteer, uh, in the, I, I happen to have worked in the political world. Uh, when I was out of work twice, I worked in political campaigns, and I didn't say to people, um, you know, I, the first time was in '86. I was living in Cambridge. 
Um, and I went to work for Joe Kennedy, who was working for Congress. And nobody asked, asked me later if I ever got paid. But I spent three days there uh, ghostwriting speeches and op-ed articles and then two days job hunting. So if, you have, if your finances allow that and there's a nonprofit or community job or volunteer position, uh, you can use that both to stay engaged in the workforce, build your network, keep your energy up and, and do great work. And also um, uh, it provides uh, some of the uh, explanation about what you're doing. But don't hide the fact that you're, you're uh, job hunting. I uh, tell people that and lead with whatever volunteer, part-time, or uh, occupation you might be using to fill your days. Our next question comes from Larry, who asks, what is the best way to a company that you've tried to get an interview with in the past but could never get a face-to-face? -face? I... I, I if I, I think the first question, Larry, is have you uh, tried to network or your way into the company? And if you're only going through the front door uh, through the formal hiring process, the odds are really tough. Uh, and I don't know where you what the company is. Uh, I know from our job board, it's not uncommon for even small employers to get 40 or 50 applications for a position. And if it's a larger or medium-sized company, uh, they might be getting hundreds of, of applications. And it's really difficult to stand out in stacks of resumes, uh, particularly when they're being reviewed by people and I, uh, who are trying to, uh, to select five or 10 people for interviews. So I think if you know you want to be in that company uh, and you can identify the hiring managers or the leaders of the sections of that company or the company's leadership. Find out where they hang out. What industry groups do they go to? Is there a monthly chamber lunch? Um, is there a professional association that uh, perhaps uh, uh, the hiring manager is on a committee or uh, on a board? Uh, and does that group have some kind of public event or lunch? And find Find, identify people inside the organization you want to connect with, find out where they hang out professionally, and, and go to those events and find ways to connect with them personally. And uh, that can lead to, it, it, once you make those sorts of connections, that can lead to informational interviews and building relationships with them. And that's the way to stand out um, in a uh, in a competitive hiring process, a formal hiring process, where you're one of several dozen or perhaps even several hundred resumes. Here's a related question that came in from Mark in Washington, D.C. He asks, should I contact organizations I'd like to work for even if there's no specific job available? How is this best done? Should I email my resume and bio? Should I call them? I think it's, it's very appropriate to reach out to those organizations. Find a reason to connect with someone there. So uh, identify the people inside the organization that you'd like to talk to and see if there's an interest you have that they could help you with uh, or and, and request an informational interview, a, a conversation to talk about that interest. The other way to do it is uh, to, again, this goes back to my earlier suggestion, uh, identify the people inside that organization and see what groups they belong to and uh, join those groups and see if you can build a relationship with them uh, uh, either through that association or, or in other ways. If you're, I'm, I'm guessing that um, you're interested in learning more about the organization, its culture, its, its uh, plans for hiring in the future. Those are all appropriate questions, um, but it has to be a focused conversation. And uh, remember that when you walk into these meetings, you have a lot to offer too. While I, I don't know your background, um, every professional can has her or his own network and uh, own connections, and, and you can make introductions, help the people you're meeting with. I think a great way to, to end any informational interview is obviously to say thank you, but then to say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And when you do this, two things happen. You're just reaffirming that you're a professional like them, a peer with 
much to author. And the second thing that will happen is often people will say, well, gosh, um, you could do uh, thank you, and I wonder if you could help me with this or that. And then that leads to an ongoing relationship, uh, but again, on a, on a peer-to-peer basis. Okay, so we're coming up against our Mac. Do you feel like you're up to some speed round here? Mac is nodding his head wildly here, folks. So the next question comes from Allison. She asks, if you're not chosen for a job, is it appropriate to email back and ask what you can improve upon? It would be helpful to know why they chose someone else. It is appropriate. And I would, uh, some people like to have those conversations by email. I, I prefer to have them by phone. You, you have to go with your personal preference. Uh, if you do want to talk to someone, uh, I would email them and say, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I'm disappointed too. I'd, I'd be grateful if you might chat with me for 10 minutes or so and give me feedback about the hiring process and what uh, uh, in my candidacy. And then I would, uh, and then I would specifically suggest times that you could meet and have a phone call and, and then walk into that conversation with a couple of questions. Okay, a couple more quick ones here, Mac. Uh, do I really need to have a LinkedIn account? This one comes from Lisa, Taiwan. Yes, uh, and the reason is LinkedIn continues to grow every month. Uh, globally, I think there's 470 million members. The number changes every month. And it is the professional network, uh, and it's a global one. So if even if you're not job hunting, you need to uh, be on LinkedIn because when, well, two reasons. One, when people search you at Google, LinkedIn is probably the second or third thing that will pop up because it has so much standing with the Google search engine. If you're not there, it will stand out. And if you are there and you have a, just your name and your degrees, uh, it's not going to serve you well because people trust LinkedIn and, and are likely to click through. And that's the first thing they'll see about you. So you need to be on it. And you need to have a, a, a full profile. OK, two more real quick ones. The next one is comes from Elaine in Vancouver. She asks, what are some tips for changing the interrogation style dynamics of a job interview? We did a great podcast about this, Elaine, with uh, Jeff Altman. If you go to our website and just click on the podcast um, uh, link in the nav bar, you'll find it. And he encourages. Uh, people in interviews to open with their own question. And he says the question you should ask is, uh, if I do this job, if I'm fortunate enough to get this job, we're sitting down in a year's time, what are the three great things you want me to tell you I've done for you? And Jeff says that this is a powerful question because it moves the, uh, the meeting away from an interrogation style um, interview to a conversation about the employer's problems. He also says it's powerful because often there's a time lag between when a posting is written and when a job is getting filled and new problems may have come up that are, are just not reflected in the in the posting. So if you have a moment, uh, listen to the interview. There's also a written transcript you can skim to. Last one. This one comes from Agnieszka, who's here in Portland. And she asks, how do, do I overcome the job search discouragement? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's challenging. I find in talking to job seekers, and again, from my own personal experience, connecting with family and friends is, is very important. Uh, recognizing that you're not defined only by your job and or your search. So make time to, to spend with people. You can't look at work 16 hours a day. You probably you need to work on it uh, Monday through Friday, but treat it like a job. Don't let it overtake your life. And recognize that um, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna find something great. And it, the fact that you're participating in a webinar like this uh, demonstrates to me that uh, you're, you're working hard on this. And uh, give, give yourself a lot of credit. Well, terrific. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we're grateful. We, we do want to finish on time because we want to be respectful of your time. Um, three quick things. I want you to know that we'll do another webinar uh, next week on Tuesday, and that'll be 12 p.m. Pacific time. And we're going to talk about how to make your next job search faster and easier. 
And if you're interested, please sign up at the URL below, snackslist.org slash webinar. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to a couple of resources. We have a free course, uh, especially for people interested in LinkedIn and online presence, but it's a three-part video course called How to Wow and Woo Employers Online. Visit our website. Uh, just click on the Courses tab in the nav bar at the top. And we have uh, another course about hacking the hidden job market, and we're going to reopen it on March 1st. So stand by to learn more about that. We did uh, we launched this course in November. We had 70 students uh, go through it, and uh, we've had a, a number of people find uh, great jobs. And so we're, we want to make that content available to you as well. Uh, and finally, we want to keep this conversation going. Uh, so we will post the slides and a recording of this webinar on our blog. It'll probably go live tomorrow morning. That might be later today, uh, but you'll find uh, Every, everything that uh, we've just shared with you today. But we also want to hear from you. So if you have more questions, more comments, or suggestions for each other, please leave them in the comments section of the blog. And you can find our blog at maxis.org slash blog. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. And I hope uh, this has been helpful to you. Uh, please, uh, again, send your questions uh, uh, in to the comments section of our blog. And I hope that you will join us uh, next Tuesday as well.